Welcome to Talent Unfiltered. Located at the intersection of innovation and all things talent. Talent Unfiltered is presented by HireWorks. HireWorks, talent forward. Now, here is your host, Ron Godier. It is Monday, April 20th, 2020. Welcome to Talent Unfiltered, presented by HireWorks. I am Ron Godier, and you are looking at Chicago, my hometown. Uh, I've always thought that Chicago was an absolutely beautiful city to look at, and I still think that. But given all the things that have happened to all of us in the last six weeks, uh, sometimes that beauty uh, can get lost. And I think we need to remember that we will come out of this and we all be, will be uh, walking around our individual hometowns uh, again at some point. We do have a great show coming up for you today in just a while. Kelly Keegan, the VP of People at Built In, will join us here uh, to talk about her experiences and insights from the last six weeks. Uh, hopefully she will offer you some things that you can take back to your organization and use to help your team members, your fellow employees feel like the important and valuable asset uh, that they really are. But before we get started, I do want to remind you, you can connect with the show on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Snapchat. The show is available on Spotify, on Buzzsprout, and on SoundCloud. And there's a video version, which some of you are clearly watching right now uh, on YouTube. You can also email the show if you like at showinfo at talentunfiltered.com. Now, all the links to our social media uh, and different platforms are in the comments section down below. If you like what we do, then please like, subscribe, share, and turn on the notification buttons so you never miss any new content uh, coming from us. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I've talked to you about a couple of things. The first is uh, an organization called Tap Click Talk, uh, run by a good buddy of mine named Andy Angelos. And I know that some of you out there are small business owners, and you are probably going through situations where you're trying to figure out exactly how you are going to navigate uh, this, how you are going to save your business. Well, that's where the bounceback.org comes in. The bounceback is a platform that allows you to go out and be able to access the different programs that the federal government and the SBA have put out there uh, for businesses like yours. Um, if you need help navigating that, if you need to understand what programs are available, this is a great place to start. Again, it's thebounceback.org. Uh, Andy has a team of professionals standing there ready to help you uh, at any time uh, and ready to answer your questions about which programs you should be uh, uh, taking part of, what programs are available to you, what are the processes that you have to go through in order to access some of this money that the federal government uh, has put out. The second thing that I want to tell you about, so please, uh, not to get ahead of myself, but please go check out Andy's um, uh, website. It is thebounceback.org. That is thebounceback.org. Uh, my company, HireWorks, rolled out uh, a fundraising effort at the beginning of the week uh, called the United We Win COVID-19 Relief Campaign. And it benefits a charitable organization called Global Giving. Now, Global Giving raises money for a number of causes around the world. Right now, they are focused on helping first responders and communities that have been ravaged, literally ravaged by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And anything you can do would be a huge help. Here's what you need to do. Go to GoFundMe.com and search Donate United. Once you search Donate United, you're going to see our banner come up. Click that banner and then donate what you can, whether that's $5, $5. $10, whatever. We had somebody donate money the other day. It was like a hundred bucks. It was, it was just, I'm, I'm always amazed by how generous uh, people are, but whatever you can give, every little bit helps. Our goal is to have 1 million people see the video and 1 million people donate a buck. If you could, if we do that, there's so much we can accomplish. So please go to gofundme.com, search donate United and take part. If you can, if you can't donate, then at least share it, get it out in front of people, let people know uh, what it is we are trying to do. Okay, so I want to go ahead and get started. Our guest today is Kelly Keegan. Uh, she is the VP of People at Built In. Uh, and for those of you not acquainted with Built In, let me give you a little bit of history. Uh, the company was founded in 2011 based on a love of Chicago, its people, and the technology uh, uh, community here. Uh, it started as a social network 
and blogging platform that gave local startups a sense of community uh, and a platform with which they could tell their stories. Now, they very quickly learned that they were, that startups were attracting talent uh, just by participating in the community. So they refocused their efforts and became a model for tech recruitment uh, by tech recruitment by harnessing the power of content and community. Now, as they like to say on their site, their vision is to connect the world through a shared passion for tech and the human need for purpose, which I think is a great saying. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kelly Keegan. Hey, Kelly, thanks so much for taking time to join us here today uh, on Talent Unfiltered. How are you doing? I mean, are you okay? Family okay? Everybody safe? Yeah, doing pretty well, adjusting to quarantine life and our new normal here, but <laughs> everyone is safe and well. Good, good. It's, uh, it's definitely weird. I know the last time uh, you and I had talked, we were preparing to do uh, an event with you guys at Built In yeah. through Hacking HR, which you know I'm a part of here in, uh, uh, in Chicago. And I think you guys made a really wise decision in, in hindsight. I think it was really wise. At the time, I was like, well, yeah, mm -hmm. it feels a little early maybe, but it, it turns out I think your, um, your cautiousness was, uh, was 100%. Uh, right on. So, um, uh, as I was leading you in, I talked to people a little bit about, you know, I explained a little bit about what built in is, and I explained a little bit about just what a cool organization uh, I think it is. And if you're from Chicago, where you and I are, uh, you're very familiar with built in Chicago, right? It's something you know uh, relatively well, particularly if you play in the in the technology space. Mm -hmm. But uh, you guys have a great office, a great space, but you had to transition to a remote workforce really quickly. Mm -hmm. And I would be interested to learn a little bit about uh, the challenges that that presented for you. Uh, and not just for you, but maybe for, uh, for your teams as well. Mm -hmm. So if you could kind of walk me through that, I'd really, I, I think everybody would find that uh, beneficial. Yeah, definitely. So I think our perspective on it is um, in everything that we do, we want to be the ones that are paving the way for the rest of the tech community to kind of sure. follow. Um, and so we were one of the early tech companies in Chicago to go remote. Um, we had been watching really closely and, and making the assessment and our mindset throughout all of this is that we want to keep our employees safe. Um, first and foremost, that was the most important thing. And so we had started with um, an optional work remotely and then quickly made the decision to have it be a requirement. Um, we actually received quite uh, quite a bit of pushback from our employees who love going into the office. <laughs> right. um, but ultimately we made the decision that not only was it the right thing for our employees, but the right thing for our community in Chicago. Um, I would say we actually fared pretty well with adjusting to remote life. Um, we, throughout Christmas and New Year's, closed down the office and everyone works remotely. So this, was, this past year was the first year we had officially done that. Um, mm -hmm. And any sort of kinks that a lot of people were working through over the last month of adjusting, we had already kind of been through. Um, and right. so our biggest action item was... Um, how do we get people set up to permanently be remote? So do they need a second monitor? Um, that was probably the main thing that we acted early on. Um, and when the week leading up to going remote, we had already started prepping. So we already had managers putting guides together around where the risks exist. Um, we were meeting to, as an entire leadership team and then an entire management team and talking about what are the expectations um, how are we going to be checking in with our teams? We have a very, very social culture. And so mm -hmm. that probably was one of the things that we were most concerned about. Um, we do a lot of activities every single day um, to bring our teams together. And so how we were going to identify what were the rituals in our culture that were most important and how do we adjust that to virtual life? Um, and then the other thing was just like being really consistent with transparency and communication. I think we all went into this assuming it was going to be like two to four weeks and now sure. we're just really unsure when it's going to end. Um, and so making sure that we were constantly communicating and transparent, we went from monthly company-wide meetings to weekly company-wide meetings. Um, our CEO is answering anonymous Q&A every single Monday. 
Um, we, our stance is to over communicate. I would much rather my employees say, okay, Kelly, we've heard this 10 times <laughs> than feel right. like they don't have the answers. Right. Um, so we're, we're doing pretty well. You know, it's interesting because you, you talked about being prepared for it by, by engaging in remote work over the holidays. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you also brought up the point, don't know how long this is going to go on. And so I think, and, I, and I'd love to get your take on this. I think sometimes a lot of companies think that the technical aspects of working remotely might be a challenge, uh, that the productivity aspects uh, might be a challenge. What I'm interested in learning are what are the psychological impacts to people the longer they are mm -hmm. remote, right? Because to me, my team has always been remote. We've always kind of worked that way. We have an office, yeah, uh, but in most cases, we're on site with clients. And so I wonder when it's a forced remote situation, mm -hmm. are there any psychological impacts that you've noticed or that you're planning for uh, kind of as this goes on? Because you're right. I don't think we know when it's going to end. Yeah. Um, I think that's been really interesting to kind of watch and assess. Um, I think that early on you saw a lot of companies either sink or swim in their approach to the whole pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I think the approach, uh, people were, I think, in fear of, you know, micromanaging or people not being productive and then quickly learned that that really, at least in our field, was not a huge issue. Um, I am very fortunate. Maria Catris, our CEO, is the most thoughtful uh, CEO that I've ever worked for. And so she, first and foremost, um, puts people before the business, right? There's no business without the people. Sure. And so checking in, she really leads by example of ensuring that people feel secure. Um, wellness is really important to us. It's really important to me. I'm um, a trained yoga teacher. So oh, checking really? in with employees, yeah, okay. early on. Um, so staying in shape for you during this is not really as hard as it might be for some of us. Uh, it's still pretty challenging. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, so we did a whole variety of things. Essentially, we have, a, we have many different culture committees and we have one that's dedicated to wellness. And so our wellness committee getting together to think about like, what are the principles of wellness, whether that is nutrition, fitness, mindfulness, et cetera. And we were trying to look at like, how can we support people while they were remote? And so I'm very into mindfulness. Um, and so I've been leading morning uh, mindfulness sessions with people. And so not just like meditation, but um, trying to do a different activity that would fall under the mindfulness umbrella every morning for people, which mm -hmm. I would say has been great. The biggest challenge people um, have been struggling with is this shift of like work-life balance because work and life, like work and home is now the same thing. Sure. Um, and so learns these morning routines that people create to like kickstart their brains to say, okay, now I'm at work. And then especially having a trigger at the end of the day to say, okay, I'm done with this because, um, you know, the things that we were most concerned about was like people who felt lonely. So we had a really good pulse around who lived alone um, mm -hmm. people who were highly social. We use um, an assessment in our, in our company and in the recruiting process called Culture Index. And okay. so it measures um, a whole variety of things, but one of them being how social someone is. And so people who were very, very high on the social metric, um, we actually worked with our consultant at Culture Index to say like, how do we support them while they're remote? What are the things we should be looking out for? Um, and then just the other piece around, like if there's nothing else to do, are people just working? Um, and so we encouraged early on people to take mental health days um, we make sure leaders are really just like checking in with the overall wellness. We offered uh, different suggestions of questions for one-on-ones so that leaders, even if they don't naturally like have that natural instinct to know how to um, like pulse virtually, at least giving them as many tools as possible to have an idea. And then really we're just like cross-functionally checking in with one another. Sure. It, you know, and you bring up some interesting points there because it's not just the employee that's having to shift how they think about things, right? It's also the manager. Uh, and some management styles lend themselves more to being face-to-face -face, uh, and some lend themselves to 
to being uh, not face to face, I guess, mm-hmm. for lack of a for lack of a better word. And I know in in our teams, because we're remote, I've had to alter the way I engage and manage my teams and run the teams in order to be able to be sensitive to that idea that everybody mm-hmm. communicates a little bit differently. And I'm, I, I'm really excited to hear that you guys are, uh, are focusing on that. When you, you know, there's so much talk now. I mean, we've, uh, uh, last week we had uh, jobs report numbers that, you know, they came out and uh, we're talking about 22 million ish uh, uh, jobs lost at the time uh, of this, uh, of this podcast. Uh, we'll know more in a couple of days, but um, it, it, it's thrown a monkey wrench into continuity planning for people. Uh, I think certain industries are super impacted by this. Uh, I'm not sure hotel and restaurant uh, and the hospitality industry will yeah. recover uh, in any kind of quick pace with the same people who were in it before. But as you begin to look forward to to the time when this is over, and you're beginning to think about how you're going to bring people back in. What are the things that you're talking about? I mean, is it, is it testing? Is it, um, you know, did you have it? Did you not have it? Uh, what, are, what are the things that you're going through as you think about what it's going to be like to reacclimate your team to uh, an office environment, even if they're not there full time? Yeah, I think that's a great question. It's been one that's been coming up a lot lately. And my answer to it, uh, even if it's causing frustration to the receiver, is I'm not there yet. I'm not ready to start planning for that yet. I don't think it's, uh, I think it's too early. I think what we've learned throughout the last month plus is agility is key. And, um, you know, I think historically, most, most folks in the, under the people umbrella when we're planning programs, initiatives, things like that. We spend a lot of time doing research, getting feedback, using data to make decisions and Mm -hmm. rolling out different programs and initiatives that are meant for the long term, right? What we're learning is things are changing so rapidly. I think the change is at least extending a little bit more now. So like in the beginning, it literally was like within hours, right? We're watching the news, things are changing, more reports are coming in and then Mm -hmm. it went to days and now, we're probably assessing on a weekly basis uh, or a bi-weekly basis, the programs, the approaches. Early on, we wanted teams to have daily standups and now it's a little bit redundant. And so mm-hmm. a program that worked a month ago is no longer working for us. Sure. And so I'm being really, um, I wanna be really respectful to my team's time and the leadership team's time as far as like, when is the right time to start planning for that? Um, that but very well could be- but let that me interrupt you there. next week though. Right, right. Let me let me interrupt you there because I, I guess I'm what I'm hearing from you is we're going to wait until we think it is the appropriate time. Mm-hmm. But with the speed with which things change, aren't there certain parts of continuity planning on how we're gonna walk back in? I understand conditions on the ground could be somewhat different than they are right sure. now, but aren't there aren't there elements of this that you can look at and go? this is how we're going to try to roll this back in. Here's some of the things that we know we're going to do when the time comes. Have you, have you given thought to that? Are you really just saying, you know what, we're going to wait and assess until the, until the time is right and, and then make our plans. Here's how I look at it. I think there are at least a half a dozen scenarios that could play out. It could be like an extreme miracle. Everything's fine. Everybody returns back to work call it next week, week after, which is not going to happen, but like best case scenario. (laughs) I'm glad you threw that out there because I was like, that's pretty wishful. Yep. But so that's on one end of the spectrum. The next could be, you know, we're doing this for another month or two and then all is okay. And we go back to the office. Um, Another scenario could be that plus we face the same thing again in the fall. Sure. Um, Or it could be that like, 25% of the company is allowed to go back. Like Mark Zuckerberg released today that um, it's only going to be uh, essentially like an optional work from office versus this like historical optional work from home. Um, And so my perspective right now is rather than spend so much time planning out for five potential scenarios that I don't know when they're going to hit, I want to be able to commit to my employees' needs as they exist today. Um, as they exist for the next week. And, you know, next week we could be changing our mind and starting to make those plans. The other thing that I think, you know, I I tend to be the kind of person that is going to look for 
the positives in any scenario. Mm -hmm. And this is a, it was a really tough one for the whole entire world. But I think one of the positives that has come out of it is the level of um, transparency and communication within the HR communities, like how willing everyone has been to share the communications they've rolled out, the programs they've developed, et cetera. Um, we've tried as much at built in to give back to the HR community as well. We're hosting these um, these community chats with each of our markets to be able to say like, we're an expert in the recruiting space. Let us tell you what we've created and like bring mm -hmm. each other together. Um, so I'm leaning a little bit on like, I can gladly come up with uh, a contingency plan for returning to the office, but somebody might already be building it and that could save me more time that I can lean into their plan and just dedicate my time to supporting my current employees in their current needs today. Sure. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure if it's the right term, but it's a very holistic approach, right? It's mm -hmm. a very um, a people centric approach. I think that there are businesses out there that can learn a lot from that. I think that there are some businesses and some industries uh, that are not as agile and they don't yeah. have that option, right? I've been talking with a number of people, uh, as I'm sure you have. I honestly believe that this one of the one of the other positives that's going to come out of this is that companies are going to be less leery of remote work. And I'm talking oh, yeah. about companies that hadn't traditionally had embraced that, right? Um, and so I think that there's some beauty there. In fact, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure we'll ever have an office per se again. Oh. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of companies out there that are feeling that way. I'm like, why am I spending all this money on a space when I can be just as productive doing it another way, right? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not naive that uh, I, I feel very fortunate that my company has the ability to work remotely. There are mm -hmm. plenty of jobs and plenty of industries where that is just not possible. Um, and so our continuity plan to return to the office, we do have a little bit more flexibility. Um, there's also, I think like we had to act fast in the beginning for the safety of our employees, but mm -hmm. the return to the office, um, I think is a nice to have for us um, versus the like need to have in order to be successful and like have people working. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think I, I love being able to try to like daydream around what this means for the future sure. of the workplace. And I started my career and just before 20, uh, 2008 when the economy crashed and my perspective of like the evolution of HR from there is I think just fascinating. I think mm -hmm. this is another time um, in my career, we're going to see a huge substantial shift of like what it means to be in the people function, what, what the entire like workplace experience means. Mm -hmm. The whole future of work, I think, is going to change drastically as a result of this. And I'm a little nervous, but I'm more excited about what that means. Well, you know, it's interesting because we're talking to, when we look at our business, our business is traditionally a, uh, a internal function, right? We're talking about recruitment marketing. We're talking about building new process. We're talking about um, uh, helping companies with bandwidth. In some cases, owning the process from cradle to grave. It just depends on the individual situation. But one of the things that we're seeing, <clears throat> and it actually leads me to a question that I think might be interesting to hear mm -hmm. your perspective on. We've begun to look at industries that are outside the norm of where we've normally worked, where we can take what we do and apply it uh, to that particular space. And some of those are essential industries where we see that in times like this of, of health crisis, um, that certain industries are going to remain viable because they're essential. Have you given any thought or has there been any discussion around other areas that you might be able to serve beyond kind of your traditional tech space that you guys uh, seem to, you know, really thrive in? Yeah, I think that, I mean, regardless of um, the pandemic, I think we've recognized in the last few years that like the traditional like startup tech world um, that people initially think about has evolved so significantly, um, recognizing that, you know, today most companies, whether it's their entire company or just like a, a section of it, um, consider themselves to be a tech company, right? Like all of mm -hmm. these, even like huge enterprise customers and maybe even like older industries, more uh, traditional industries are having um, 
like business intelligent teams being formed, mm -hmm. having like an engineering heavy team that they still need to be able to attract that talent. And so you've seen a lot of shifts um, for like larger enterprise clients. I think for us going after um, the remote workforce, which we were already doing and now is going to be inevitable with how all of this has panned out. I think sure. we recognized, um, you know, the need to be able to support uh, more at the enterprise level um, than just traditional small like tech startups. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm excited for Built-in's name to just continue to grow and recognize that essentially what we're trying to do is connect individuals with what they're passionate about to companies that are aligned with that and their values. And I think especially throughout this whole scenario, like I'm talking to friends at other companies who who their leadership team is just not dealing with it well. Like they're mm -hmm. they're missing the human aspect, and so now more than ever, people are going to be craving that and seeking that out. Yep. Um, and I'm glad that we have partners that are on built in that we get to tell their story and like connect to those individuals. You know, it's interesting because there are so many industries that don't have the benefit of what you're talking about. Uh, you mentioned that they are older, sometimes more mature industries. And in some cases, they don't necessarily, they're not technically um, a forward thinking. Uh, I think that there is a uh, an opportunity for real innovation here in my space, particularly. We talk to clients all the time um, when they need bandwidth help, when they need a uh, a, a recruiter. Uh, someone that uh, can come in and help them either from a process standpoint or just a delivery standpoint. Mm -hmm. And we talk to them all the time about remote resources. Why wouldn't you want a remote resource? And they want to control that resource right there. A lot yeah. of that comes from um, what I think in some cases is an out, outdated way of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I've always argued you can deliver a happier less expensive resource if you're willing to consider these things. And I think people across all industries are going to begin to, to see that that is a real possibility. Um, you well, know, you I, think, I mean, part I'm of sorry, it is ahead. like the unfamiliar is scary, right? So uh -huh. if you uh, have a traditionally like older workforce and you just are not used to that experience, it's just sure. unfamiliar. And now everybody's going to be used to it. And so you'll have a, a like proven uh, research, proven experience, like experiment of can this work for your company? And it's not going to work for everybody's, but I think right. way more companies are going to realize it does work for them. It, it gives you, this whole experience gives you uh, a new appreci appreciation for uh, people who um, are in jobs. And I know this is kind of off topic from what we were talking about, mm -hmm. but they're in jobs where remote work is not an option for them. First responders, yeah. nurses, people who work at Target, right? Who have to be out there in the middle of it all the time. And then a goof like me comes in with a mask and gloves on and, you know, where's your corn, right? I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a bizarre experience, but you, you know, you hope that they are, um, uh, that at some point, I don't know. There's that you just have to you have to appreciate. I think what it is uh, they are doing for us each and every day. I want to move on here because mm -hmm. you mentioned something before that I think is um, is interesting. How will this shape uh, the future of work? I think we've talked about uh, remote uh, as part of that equation, but I wonder what you think companies will do to future-proof, pandemic-proof, catastrophe-proof uh, their business uh, moving forward. Because I don't believe that this is the last one that we're going to see. Maybe even this year, as you pointed out, yeah. we could have this come back at the end of the year again. Yeah. I mean, I think there's going to be significantly stronger um, business continuity plans, greater planning uh, in terms of succession planning, um, a greater breakdown of like – what are we doing and what's adding value measuring true ROI um, really looking at, I mean, I think something that we dealt with probably like acknowledged around week two or three was that we were adjusting to remote life and there were just so many meetings taking place and really like pushing to ask the question of like, is this the most effective and productive way for us to communicate and to work? Mm -hmm. And so really testing, um, how do we shift our approach? I think there's going to be a lot of that. I think, you know, I'll flip it to more of the human side of things. And, um, and this kind of goes back to our conversation from earlier around like, how are you supporting individuals? I think that this idea of like a blanketed approach or like a blanketed benefit that covers everyone, I think 
what you're going to see in terms of the like evolution of, of people and like people teams is just going to be a more unique and customized approach. One of the things that's interesting, and I, I, this, this isn't something we've talked about before, but I, I'd love to get a, a kind of a hot take on it if we could. I find it interesting that in this particular situation, we have found ways to include hourly and gig workers in unemployment benefits in times of crisis. Yeah. And I wonder if that's one of those things, in your opinion, that will somehow carry forward. I'm not sure the current crop of politicians uh, are going to have a stomach or an appetite for that going forward. But I do see that it's now possible to potentially do that. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because I did think it was kind of an interesting turn uh, in yeah. terms of how they approached um, uh, helping people as the, as the unemployment numbers really began to take off. Yeah. I mean, that that's a loaded question. I, but I, I know. Say, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, so here's the thing, like sometimes change is unavoidable and sometimes change is forced. And this is going to be one of those scenarios where change is forced. And as painful as all of this is, um, I'm hoping that there's a lot of really good change that comes out as a result. Same thing with our healthcare system, like the flexibility and adjustments that have been made um, on the, the benefit side of things, like whether that is just extension of offerings that all of, you know, our Blue Cross Blue Shield had an extension of if somebody gets laid off and like their coverage and what that looks like. And I think there's an opportunity for however all of this shakes out over the next few months for somebody to, you know, many people to really step in and force that change to continue um, because, yeah, there's, there's too much <laughs> that needs to happen. I'll keep it at that. <laughs> hey, well, yeah, I mean, and I try to always avoid um, conversations about uh, political beliefs uh, on this because I know not everybody in the world shares mine. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, what I do believe is that <clears throat> we've seen not only the ability for people to innovate and flex, but we've also seen where the holes in the system are, right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of how we're able to deliver uh, what we're able to deliver and when we're able to deliver. I know. But I just, I'll add in, I, not necessarily political related, but of that same thing. Of <laughs> okay, like go ahead. Be, how, be edgy. It's okay. It's not that edgy. Um, but <laughs> thinking about um, all of these things that people said couldn't be done or like that there's a right way to do them. Like, look at the fact that you have people uh, like these late night talk show hosts that are just leading their shows virtually like sure. Saturday night live was literally filmed from everyone's home. Like this idea of like, you have to be in a studio and doing those things. Mm -hmm. Like if this is the opportunity for people to realize that all these things that people said can't be done or like you weren't, it was like, wasn't the right environment for it. If it gives people that momentum to try things yep. um, or set a new way of doing something, I'm all about that. I think it's, I think it's cool. You know, it's interesting because I started this podcast thing right as the pandemic itself took off. It was my first week. Uh, it was right in the throes of it, right? It had just become a real thing and everybody was beginning to kind of get very anxious about it in the first part of March. And, uh, uh, and what I've watched is a lot of different things. Um, <clears throat> I just uh, was talking to somebody uh, the other day and what I've taken away from this, because not only do I, I work in my company in terms of helping the delivery teams, but I also am doing a lot of business development. I do it just like this. I don't always have the lights on me or whatever, like we do for the podcast, but I try to think about how I'm going to be viewed by the person on the other side. And one of the people I really respect is a guy by the name of Hung Lee. He was a guest on the show uh, a few weeks ago out mm -hmm. of London. And he talked about it. He said, the people who get good at this are the ones that are going to have the advantage going forward. Yeah. Um, and so I can tell you sitting underneath stage lights gets very warm, very quick. Uh, I wouldn't want to do every sales call this way, but it has made a huge difference in terms of uh, how I'm perceived because behind me, my laundry isn't sitting there and I've given yep. some thought to, you know, to how this, how this ought to look. And, and I think it'll be, I think it'll be interesting to see, particularly in, in jobs that have historically been done face to face, but have a way to uh, virtualize them, right? I think mm -hmm. that'll be kind of interesting. So I know we're getting down to it here. I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but I'd like you to share with us, uh, if you could, uh, advice that you would give HR and business leaders about 
what they should be thinking about uh, as we get ready to, however long it is, begin to yeah. think about returning to some sense of normalcy, right? What are the kinds of things, I know you're not planning per se, but what are the things that you're thinking about that you can make better or different or maybe better or maybe different through nothing you do? Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's so many things that we're thinking about. I would say probably um, what's happened during this time is people are forced to communicate more and be more transparent. And I would say that should not change um, throughout the entire process when you're, when hopefully things are back to normal and you're in the office, keep that transparency and that communication consistent um, and at the forefront of decision-making. I think that, um, the more inclusive you can be with the decisions that you make, the better. Um, whether that is, you know, I think traditionally it's it can be like a CEO and HR making the decision or it's an executive team, but um, the more you can think about the thoughtfulness for your entire company, um, the better. And the more available you are to answer questions. And so as you're thinking about going back, really think about every single person, think about the um, alternative solutions. So like you may be ready to go back. Some people still may, may feel unsafe. And so making sure you're communicating that, giving them that platform to ask questions um, and just being like highly, highly thoughtful to the way in which people may react. It's um, interesting because don't, I think that there's going to be a percentage of our population that may never be a hundred percent comfortable with yeah. being around people until we have a vaccine and everybody's been vaccinated, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of those times when, and again, I know I'm going to take a beating for this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I wonder how the anti-vax people are going to respond to this. Um, I, you know, I don't want to get into that that whole thing, but you know, I kind of believe in science, so I I, I think it'll be interesting to see what uh, uh, what happens. Anyway, I'm not going to take the bait on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I tried, I tried, I tried to throw it out there, but you weren't going to do it, and that's why you are a much better. Uh, uh, HR leader than <laughs> I am. Um, okay. Hey, Kelly, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, taking some time to come and talk to us today. Uh, Built in is a wonderful organization. Uh, and in the short time that I have known you, uh, I've already gotten a great deal of respect for how you go about things. And, uh, and I really appreciate you taking time to be here uh, with us on Talent Unfiltered. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been my pleasure. Okay, awesome, everybody. That is Kelly Keegan, VP of People for Built In Chicago, Built In in general. Well, that's going to do it for us today. We want to thank Kelly Keegan for taking some time to join us here on Talent Unfiltered. I got so much out of that conversation, and I hope that you did as well. I hope you got some things that you can take back to your company and put into action. Now, if you like what we did here today and you want to stay up to date, then like, subscribe, and share on your platform of choice. Make sure you turn on those notification buttons so you don't miss any content. You can also connect with me or the show on social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Snapchat, or you can just find me on LinkedIn. Now, new episodes of Talent Unfiltered drop every Monday. We hope you'll join us next Monday for a brand new episode of the show. Till then, peace.